Henry VIII and Church of England. In 1534, Henry VIII severed ties between the English Church and Rome. This was an overtly political move as part of his wider European foreign policy, but the implications for the Church in England were immediate and devastating. The break with Rome came when Pope Clement VII refused, over a period of years, to annul Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, not purely as a matter of principle, but also because the Pope lived in fear of Catherine's nephew, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, as a result of events in the Italian Wars. Henry first asked for an annulment in 1527. After various failed initiatives he stepped up the pressure on Rome, in the summer of 1529, by compiling a manuscript from ancient sources arguing that, in law, spiritual supremacy rested with the monarch and also against the legality of papal authority. In 1531 Henry I challenged the Pope when he demanded £100,000 from the clergy in exchange for a royal pardon for what he called their illegal jurisdiction. He also demanded that the clergy should recognize him as their sole protector and supreme head. The Church in England recognized Henry VIII as supreme head of the Church of England on the 11th of February 1531. Nonetheless, he continued to seek a compromise with the Pope, but negotiations, which had started in 1530 and ended in 1532, with the papal legate Antonio Giovanni failed. In May 1532 the Church of England agreed to surrender its legislative independence and canon law to the authority of the monarch. In 1533 the statute in restraint of appeals removed the right of the English clergy and laity to appeal to Rome on matters of matrimony, tithes and oblations. It also gave authority over such matters to the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. This finally allowed Thomas Granmer, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, to issue Henry's annulment, and upon procuring it, Henry married Anne Boleyn. Pope Clement VII excommunicated Henry VIII in 1533. In 1534 the act of submission of the clergy removed the right of all appeals to Rome, effectively ending the Pope's influence. The first act of supremacy confirmed Henry by statute as the supreme head of the Church of England in 1536. Due to clergy objections the contentious term supreme head for the monarch later became supreme governor of the Church of England, which is the title held by the reigning monarch to the present. Such constitutional changes made it not only possible for Henry to have his marriage annulled but also gave him access to the considerable wealth that the church had amassed. Thomas Cromwell, as vicar general, launched a commission of inquiry into the nature and value of all ecclesiastical property in 1535, which culminated in the dissolution of the monasteries, 1536 to 1540. Within a decade, the entire monastic community had been dismantled, with monks and nuns ejected from the closed world of their institutions. The English land escape was thus altered forever, as abbeys, nunneries and monasteries were reduced to rubble. A large amount of building material was recycled in new secular buildings, and a few houses were converted into domestic dwellings. The church was also under attack by religious reformers, pushing for a Protestant Reformation that would change the way people worshipped. They, too, gradually prevailed, and the consequent liturgical changes, and reinterpretation of the relationship between the congregation and the priest, radically altered the use of space within churches. The lavish ornamentation that was a feature of pre-Reformation churches was comprehensively destroyed, along with its symbolism. It is still possible to see the physical scars of this process within today's churches. The effects of the dissolution of the monasteries can still be seen today, in the ruins of monastic buildings scattered across the landscape. Most monasteries simply ceased to exist. 
their structures were torn down, and the stone recycled in new buildings in the local community. Henry VIII's decision to strip the assets of the monasteries was instigated by a direct need for cash, but it also provided an opportunity to assert the power of the state over the church. Teams of commissioners were sent out by royal command. They were often drawn from the ranks of the local community and were people who had coexisted with the monasteries for generations. In some cases they would have been known, personally, by the abbots and monks they were about to dispossess. The process of dissolution was brutally simple. The monastic seal of the abbey in question was broken, to ensure that the abbot could take no further legal action in the name of the house. Valuables such as gems and plate from the shrine were collected and appropriated by the king as the head of the church. Finally, the most symbolic act of destruction was carried out, the church that had been used by the monastic community was destroyed to prevent future use. The monks were cast out into secular society, some given pensions and new appointments, others left to wander the countryside or find a new calling abroad. The commissioners usually left the walls of the church standing. Surviving ruins, such as those of Fountains Abbey, provide a vivid illustration of the sophistication of medieval architecture, the walls and arches still support themselves even though only part of a larger structure now remains. Opposition to the destruction of monastic houses was strongest in the northern and eastern shires, where communities were more reliant on monasteries for pastoral care. The only popular protest, known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, was forcibly suppressed in 1536, and in general the destruction continued unopposed. However, by the end of the 16th century there is a discernible feeling of regret over the loss of so many beautiful buildings, expressed by Shakespeare when he writes of the bare ruined choirs where late the sweet bird sang. Henrician Reform Henry VIII was essentially a Catholic, but one who rid himself of allegiance to the Pope and the Saints. Henry passed the Act of Succession and the Act of Supremacy which essentially declared himself the supreme head of the Church of England. His main concern was to gain control of the Church's vast wealth, and to ease his path with regard to his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, rather than to radically alter the way the liturgy was performed. Thus, in secular cathedrals and other non-monastic churches, the liturgy initially continued much as it always had, albeit on a much reduced scale. This is not to say that secular cathedrals were exempt from the process of change that had been unleashed by the break with Rome. Such actions were occurring all across England, as the bones of saints were dragged out from their reliquaries and destroyed. Occasionally these efforts were thwarted, as at Durham, where the monks were able to save the body of St. Cuthbert when the commissioners opened the shrine, and later reburied him in the cathedral. Edwardian Reform When Henry's young son, Edward VI, reigned 1547-53, came to the throne, he was unlike his father in that he was a true Protestant, who wanted to bring the English church into line with his beliefs. The consequent Edwardian destruction of symbols of popery resulted in the further desecration of shrines and relics, and the destruction of images across the country. The boy king ordered changes to the English church that were far more radical than anything his father had ever envisaged. They would leave churches plain, silent, and virtually unrecognizable as the same buildings which had once housed the vibrant machines for worship of the late Middle Ages. In 1547, all chantries were suppressed. At York Minster, for instance, there had been about 50 chantries centered on the altars in the side chapels around the church, but after 1547 the services at these altars ceased. 
Previously the minster had been alive with the sound of a constant round of masses and prayers, but now worship was solely focused on a reduced liturgy in the choir. These services would not have been attended by lay people, who continued to worship in their local parish churches. The minster's nave stood empty and unused as there were no longer any shrines to attract pilgrims. Any remaining ornaments set with gold, silver and jewels were seized. The great rood the focus of lay devotion was destroyed. The young king also seized vestments, as these were silk, embroidered with precious metals and stones. The final blow came in 1554, when biblical texts such as the Ten Commandments were required to be painted above the high altar in place of the old images of saints that had once aided devotional worship. The other major change instituted by Edward was the translation of the liturgy into English as the Book of Common Prayer. The medieval Latin liturgy had been understood only by a few, thus increasing the sense of the service as a secret, holy mystery performed by a specially ordained priest. This was totally against the Protestant belief that individuals could communicate directly with God without the intervention of the priest. So, in the New Anglican Church, an English liturgy meant that everyone could participate fully in the services. Reorganization. Although Mary I, daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, briefly restored Catholicism and old practices after Edward's death in 1553, her half sister, Elizabeth I, once crowned, quickly returned England to Protestantism. Under the so-called Elizabethan settlement, most of the changes begun by Edward VI were continued. Images, including those put up during Mary's reign, were destroyed, only some stained glass was left untouched, perhaps because of the expense of re-glazing broken windows. The most symbolic change, however, was the replacement of the great rood above the screen with the royal arms. In part, this was because roods had been a focus of pre-Reformation devotion and therefore were idolatrous, but it also served to emphasize that the church was now part of the state, with the monarch as its supreme head. There was very little new building during the late 16th and early 17th centuries, but much money was spent on adapting older churches to the new ways. Lord's Reforms under Elizabeth I and James I, the Anglican Church was reasonably tolerant, allowing individual congregations to decide how they wanted to worship within the prescribed limits of the prayer book. With James's son Charles I, this delicate balance was upset. Charles strongly believed in the divine right of kings, and the appointment of William Lord as Archbishop of Canterbury in 1633 saw the elevation of a man with equally authoritarian views. Lord believed that every church in England should strictly adhere to his wishes for a more ritualistic church, with a return to the use of vestments and ornaments such as crosses and candles. But those of a more puritanical belief felt these changes were returning the Church of England to popish practices. Scotland in particular had moved towards a Presbyterian method of worship, where the congregation had a far greater influence in the way services were conducted. However, Lord firmly believed in a hierarchical system of government and in 1638 attempted to impose a system of dioceses and bishops onto the Church of Scotland. The rejection of this plan, which inspired Scottish leaders to sign the National Covenant, helped to polarize factions within the English church into high or low factions, depending on where they thought authority should reside, in the bishops, as Lord wanted, high church, or in the individual congregations and their ministers as the Presbyterians wanted, low church. Radicalism and Reform the English Civil War saw the victory of Parliament over the King. It also signified the triumph of those who wished to see the end of a hierarchical church, 
with archbishops and bishops making the decisions, and opened the floodgates for a wave of radical ideas about alternative forms of worship. The seeds of a more secular form of worship were sown and would flourish in the later 17th century. Ecclesiastical architecture was no longer required to conduct a service and the growth of movements dependent on meeting houses, preaching and gospel-inspired teaching can be traced to the commonwealth installed in the aftermath of the civil war. The man who typified the new parliamentarian beliefs was MP, Oliver Cromwell. His organization of the new model army, with its strict drills and discipline, coupled with prayer and worship, was responsible for winning the war and bringing King Charles I to trial. He naturally occupied a powerful position in the Army Council, the effective rulers of England after the purging of Parliament, and was in a key position to shape the religious future of the ensuing Commonwealth and Protectorate. The rejection of monarchy and an episcopal system of church government after the execution of the king in January 1649 opened the floodgates for religious reform. A new wave of desecration followed, as images and relics that had escaped the dissolution now found themselves without protection. A parliamentary commission, led by William Dowsing, saw to it that English churches were cleansed of superstitious pictures. The ornate interior of St. George's Chapel at Windsor, one of the finest examples of 15th century architecture, was stripped bare and the whole chapel so dismantled that, at the burial of Charles I, the former arrangement could not be recognized. The end of the Civil War saw a return to religious compromise. Both high and low views could be accommodated within the same state church, although everyone was required to accept the ultimate authority of the king. A new way of designing churches that was Anglican, rather than Catholic or Presbyterian, also began to develop out of this compromise. Present Day Despite the church's increased religious vigor its role in society was being diminished. State or civil registration of births, marriages and deaths was introduced in the 1830s, the origins of the modern registry office wedding. This removed from the church its former role in charting the progress of people's lives. These changes have accelerated into the 21st century, as more and more people have chosen civil weddings and funerals, and church attendance has slowly fallen. Church of England Facts The British monarch is considered the supreme governor of the church. Among other privileges, he or she has the authority to approve the appointment of archbishops and other church leaders. The Church of England is considered the original Church of the Anglican Communion, which represents over 85 million people in more than 165 countries. The Church of England contends that the Bible is the principal foundation of all Christian faith and thought. Followers embrace the sacraments of baptism and holy communion. While the Church upholds many of the customs of Roman Catholicism, it also embraces fundamental ideas adopted during the Protestant Reformation. It upholds teachings found in early Christian doctrines, such as the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Church also reveres 16th century Protestant Reformation ideas outlined in texts, such as the 39 Articles and the Book of Common Prayer. The Archbishop of Canterbury is thought to be the most senior cleric in the Church. The Church's bishops play a lawmaking role in Britain. Twenty-six bishops sit in the House of Lords and are referred to as the Lord's Spiritual. In recent years, women and homosexuals were given the opportunity to participate in the Church's leadership roles.